Hey guys, it's Judy from Nutrition with Judy. Alright guys, I hope you guys have been having a good week. Please subscribe, please hit the bell. This allows me to provide you guys more free content. Hi guys, it's Judy from Nutrition with Judy and today I am very excited. I have with me Joan Ifland and for those of you that don't know her, she is everything that has to do with food addiction. She yeah. wrote a book, the I guess first formal textbook that has everything to do with food addiction and she can tell you more about herself. So hi Joan, thank you so much for joining me today. If you could tell me a little bit about yourself and what got you interested in food addiction. Thank you, um, and thanks so much for inviting me. I'm really, really happy to be here. I think food addiction is more, much more prevalent than people realize, and yet when they find out about it, sometimes that is just makes all the difference in terms of their ability to get their food uh, back under control. Right, right. So I started this, uh, I kind of say I started it at conception. Uh, my grandfather owned a candy store. I think sugar addiction has been a big problem in that side of the family and totally unrecognized. So my mother was a very volatile person. I mean, she could go from zero to furious in a nanosecond. And, you know, as a small child, that was really, really hard to live with. So when I had my own children, I was just determined I was not going to be that kind of mother. And yet I would have that experience where I would be perfectly normal one minute and screaming the next minute. So I was doing a lot of things because I did not want to be that mother. And over the years, I have to tell you so many times mothers have come in and said, oh, gosh, you know, I should have had a meltdown right there. You know, they knew that they were building to a meltdown, and yet they didn't have it. Wow. So you can imagine, I was doing therapy, I was doing women's groups, I was doing 12-step groups, I was doing everything I could think of, and it was still happening. So I would still have just had these moments of, of rage. And then it was so awful, I would be kind of looking at myself from the outside saying, gosh, I wish you would stop that. And uh, it was quite traumatic. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine how excited I was in 1996, January of 96. I went on yet another weight loss program. Uh, it had been recommended to me by somebody who was in one of my groups, you know, trying to get my personality under control, my behavior under control. And she could hear it. She could hear from the nature of my behavior. She could hear the sugar driving my behavior. Wow. And so gently, she just a couple of times during the year, she suggested this other program to me in this book. And finally, I had regained the weight. I was a yo-yo dieter. So, well, I guess I need a new diet. So I tried that diet. And the diet, quote unquote, was just to eliminate sugars and flours and then to eat protein, starches, vegetables, fruits, fats in uh, a particular combination. Well, you know, you can imagine my shock when week three, January 96, I'm standing in my kitchen and I'm thinking, wow, nobody's really needed to be yelled at in three weeks. <laughs> I haven't had to do any like serious correcting in three weeks and nobody's really had a problem that I needed to solve for them in three weeks. And then it just hit me. Oh my gosh, this has got something to do with the food. Wow. So that Saturday, fortunately, I had joined a support group for this particular, what I thought was a diet. And I went and I said, do people become less irritable and depressed on this, on this food plan? And they're like, yeah, it's normal, typical. I'm like, dang, you know, all those years of therapy. By then I'd done 10 years of therapy and all those weekends with the women's group, and all that stuff, that wasn't the issue at all. I had refined carbohydrates in my system that were driving bad behavior, a behavior I didn't want. And at the same time, you know, I was losing two pounds a week and I was never hungry and my allergies went away and the bloating went away and the fatigue went away and the brain fog went away. I'm just like, what the heck is going on? So I um, immediately started a handout 
for all the other mothers at the school, my, the little school where my kids were, and like nobody could do it. Just, oh, they probably just don't know how. So I spent three years writing this uh, long, popular book about my family's experience with getting off of sugars and flowers. Because I told my family, with the help of my therapist, uh, that they couldn't bring any more. They couldn't bring these sugars and flowers into the house. Uh, they couldn't eat them in front of me. In other words, they were just no longer allowed to trigger me. And I wasn't going to buy them for them or take them to get them. Right. So I wasn't going to enable them. And fortunately, I was a good cook. I was used to cooking. We were not an eat out family. So I was able to organize on a couple of hours on the weekend. I would cook everything, you know, just pack the oven, pack the top of the stove, get the grill going, get out the crock pot and make a lot of food and then put half of it in the freezer so that all week long I was just pulling out cooked foods and either chopping it up and putting it into a salad or a soup or a stir fry or packing it into a lunch or arranging it on a dinner plate. So that was a big breakthrough in terms of making the food part of it easy to manage. Well, I went on, you know, the book came out and no, it didn't start this whole big, like, I thought, gosh, everybody's going to love this as soon as they learn about it. I didn't know about addictions at that time. So I thought it was just a matter of information. Well, I, you know, the book did well, but I couldn't get on national TV because I didn't have a nutrition degree. So I went back to school. I earned a PhD in addictive nutrition, which is much more about addiction than nutrition. I'm not a nutritionist and I couldn't prescribe a supplement to save my life and I'm not licensed to do that. That's a really amazing skill set that I don't have. So I am much more like the person you would turn to if you had cocaine addiction or alcoholism. Uh, because what I have learned over all these years is that just like beverages are divided into alcoholic and non-alcoholic, the alcoholic beverages are very controlled. You know, they're heavily taxed and you can only get them in certain places. You have to show ID. It's very regulated. You know, the same thing with food. There are addictive foods. They should be identified, at least identified as such. They're not. They're parading out there as food. And then there's real food. So, you know, as the, as the years went on, I tried a lot of different things to try to help people understand and get started and have this incredible way of life. But between the PhD program and then CRC Press did ask me to write the textbook for the field, between that three years of PhD and three years of writing the textbook, I finally got it. This is a brain problem and it's a bad one. It's a very deeply seated, deeply ingrained alteration of the way neurons fire and it's in a part of the brain that controls behavior. The part of the brain where we're thinking, the frontal lobe, doesn't really control behavior. It's really controlled by the automatic part of the brain. So now I get it. Now I get it. Finally, 24 years later, uh, when I put when I turned in the the textbook manuscript, I immediately turned towards developing an online service. It was that's co consistent with the idea of a really severe, deeply rooted, deeply seated addiction. And when you have that kind of extensive dysfunction in neurons, you can fix that. You can retrain those neurons. You can retrain the brain to learn a new language. You can retrain the brain to uh, you know, learn physics. You can retrain the brain to learn anything. But you have to retrain it. So um, now two, two years later, we've had this online service, the Addiction Reset Community, for two years now. Oh, okay. It's working. Uh, it's, it recognizes the depth of retraining needed. Within that community, um, would you say that majority of people that kind of go through the process don't ever relapse again? Or what have you seen so far in the two years? Uh, gosh, this is such a good question. 
So what is relapsing? So here's, here's the parallel. Suppose you're learning a new language and you, you've, you study your vocabulary, you study your grammar, you listen to the, the tapes and you, you practice talking. You're learning the language. You go, say you're learning Italian, you go to Italy. And you, the first thing that happens is you come across the situation. You don't have the vocabulary for it. You just haven't gotten that vocabulary word yet. Mm. So you have a lapse. You can't speak. You can't communicate. Your brain's not working. And what you do is you go back and you learn that vocabulary word. Learning how to not lapse, learning how to have control over food is pretty similar. And you, it's a process. So we have great research from a man named John F. Kelly. And how long does it actually take to recover from an addiction? And he's in his work in alcohol and drugs. Mm -hmm. Processed food addiction, you can argue, is quite a bit worse, more deeply seated. And he says it takes five years. Five years, wow. And Wait, it's, go ahead. The process is gradually your periods of control become longer and your periods of lapsing become shorter and less frequent. That is a process that takes years. And so what we see in the ARC, the Addiction Reset Community, is exactly that. People come in, they're, they're still uh, imagining that they can eat foods or they're still losing control to the addictive parts of the brain. And then gradually, you know, they get a couple of days of abstinence together. And then the next lapse is only a day instead of 10 weeks gradually they build up. This is neuron strength. So this is just neurons are just like muscles. Yeah. If you yeah. neglect a muscle, it becomes weak and flabby. And if you exercise the muscle, it becomes strong and you can pick up heavier and heavier things or run faster or lift greater weights or whatever. But you know the difference. It's everybody's really clear the difference between a strong muscle and a weak muscle. Neurons are the same. Whatever you exercise is going to control your behavior. So the ARC has four hours per day of live programming, live meetings. Myself and a group of three or four other people run these uh, chats. The three of them are video chats so that you get the visual identification. And then one of them is a recorded conference call. We have now just these huge archives of recorded calls. So people can, anytime they start to feel weak, they can listen to a conference call and, the strong, and strengthen the control neurons in the brain. It just works. It works unbelievably well. But I think the reason why nothing else seems to work is because people have vastly underestimated the number of hours needed to retrain neurons to be strong and have control. So does that make sense? Yes, yes, it totally makes sense. Um, one question I had for you, and I'll get back to the you know retraining of the neural pathways and um, how it takes five years um, in a question we have down um, down in the conversation. Yeah. But yeah. Um, you know, just uh, you know, there are some people that seem to be more obviously addicted to food, and then there's some that don't. Um, what? What do you think are the mechanisms or the reasons why certain people are more addicted than others? Um, and is it, you know, based on the food we eat? And I mean, it sounds like yes, but I mean, if yeah. you can explain. Yeah. So there are a number of things that can program neurons to crave and control eating behavior. And of course, exposure to the substance. So everybody knows that if you, um, if you're repeatedly, Drinking or smoking, those are the most common addictions in our cultures. Uh, eventually, you set up a craving. And in the case of processed foods, the tragedy was that nobody realized that they were doing it. Right. Tobacco came in, the big tobacco corporations came into processed foods in the mid-1980s, and they started hiding sugar, flour, fat, salt, gluten, dairy, <clears throat> in their products 
So you might have bought a loaf of bread in 1970 that did not cause you to eat the loaf, the rest of the loaf after you've eaten one. But by 1995 or so, that bread was so loaded up with salt, sugar, fat, and heaven only knows what else, that um, you would eat one slice and it would set off these now pre-programmed craving pathways in the brain. And those, cra those craving pathways would be strong enough to actually control behavior. People think they control their behavior out of their frontal lobe, but the, but the frontal lobe is about 2%. Well, actually, I just read something that it's more like 1 million. 1 million, the strength of the rest of the brain. So once you really get that most behavior is stimulated by uh, pre-programmed primitive neurons that aren't thinking, they're reacting, it's a huge, huge difference between thinking and a reflex. So when you think of the ratio of reflecting, just reflexive neurons is about a million to one to the frontal lobe. It's just like, oh man, I gotta get that, I gotta get those primitive neurons under control. And I'm not gonna do that just by learning about this. Learning takes place in that little tiny minuscule frontal lobe. The rest of the brain is actually controlling behavior based on reacting to signals in the environment. So first get the signals in your environment under control, and then you'll be amazed at how much easier it is. Right. But do you think that certain individuals, like maybe genetically, are those neurons are more kind of wired for it than other individuals? I think that the biggest factor is the frequency with which People have been exposed to these addictive substances, food-like substances. The biggest factor is the extent to which you are ex have been exposed to the substance. So, for example, if you are never exposed to uh, tobacco, you will never develop tobacco addiction. No matter what your genetics are, no matter how many ads you see for it, if you never try it, so they think that the nicotine addiction is established after three cigarettes. You will never develop it. So there, <laughs> this is going to sound funny, but I think the major, there are three major factors in whether and how severely somebody's going to develop the addiction. Availability, affordability, and how much advertising you're exposed to. Wow. And so the more addictive product uh, elements in the product and the younger you're exposed, those are also going to drive the severity, the depth of it. So it's just, if you can just, this is the hard part. The really hard part is to start to think of white powders or crystals, like sugars and flowers, and just, just shift that gaze over to a pile of cocaine. If you can just get your brain to believe deeply, deeply that these are not foods and that they are addictive substances, a lot of things start to make sense. And the biggest thing is, oh, repeat exposure. Oh, yeah, that's how you develop the addiction. Yeah. So genetics can play a part, but I think the greatest part, people say, oh, well, yes. Um, People with this particular genetic, uh, it's called an allele. It's the TAC A1 allele. Uh, they turn out, to, uh, they're more likely to have alcoholism. They're more likely to have obesity. It's one of the pieces of evidence we use to say, no, 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 this is not overeating. This is an addiction to a set of substances. It's, it's a very powerful piece of evidence. But do I think it's driving the addiction? Because you just see that in the years leading up to, oh, you know, the mid-1980s when tobacco came in, obesity and overweight in the United States was running at about 45%, and it was fairly stable. And then you get this 20-year period where tobacco is ramping up the addictive properties, the advertising, the availability, the cheap prices, the young age. They're just working the addiction business model 20 years. 
And then you see obesity and overweight stabilizes at a new level, which is about 70%. Wow. That didn't have anything to do with genetics. Right, right. I know that. Um, so in your model, then, what would you define as because I, I know that in some of your videos, you said, you just got to get out the processed food. So what what do you define as processed foods? And what would you consider are real foods? Um, and the foods that you sort of have to remove to then get on your process of healing? Super good question. It is the processing. So edible plants have natural and lovely endorphins in them. So it's not just like, okay, I have to eat because otherwise I'll die of starvation. No, it's like Mother Nature is so nice. So there are these endorphins in edible plants and um, edible animals. And they, uh, you know, they, they have this nice mix. Some of them activate dopamine, some serotonin, some the opiates, uh, some the endocannabinoids, which is the same pathway activated by cannabis. And so it's lovely to eat. It's, it's a survival mechanism. So the problem comes when you, when you concentrate those endorphins and you make them able to be absorbed so quickly that they start to create an elevated addictive response in the brain. So like if you eat, uh, if you were to actually chew a grain, I don't know if you've ever tried to do this. I used to, I, I'm off grains now, but um, at one point I made something called oat groats. You have to chew a long time to, to eat that food. It, it just means that the kernel hasn't been ground up or cracked or made any smaller than the kernel itself. It would be hard to get high off of that. You would have to chew for a very long time and eat a very big quantity of it. So it is the processing. It's breaking down the plant. It's taking out the fiber. And the goal is to get the absorption to be very quick so that you do actually get that addictive high. And then the crash. And then in the crash is where uh, the compulsion comes from. So what, what would you say are the foods then that you would recommend? So, um, you know, for example, ground beef in a sense is processed, right? So what would you consider are foods that are ideal to eat? Okay. So, yes, beef is processed, but it's not concentrated. Okay. Yeah, so you just, it's kind of in the same density as, as it was when it was a chunk of beef as when it came out to be ground beef. So the, the top of the list is clearly sugar. We know that sugar, we have lots of evidence that sugar is more addictive than cocaine. Right. So that's just, that's a, a no brainer. <laughs> yeah. And high fructose corn syrup came right behind it. That was another element in the 1980s that caused this just this explosion of obesity in such a short time. It was the introduction of very, very cheap high fructose corn syrup. So the tobacco companies are looking at this industry. They've been looking at it for decades. And when we, you got uh, cheap high fructose corn syrup, then they said, oh, we don't have to rely on the expensive sugar from the sugar cartel. So here we go. And I think that was a big factor in their decision to enter the processed food market. They're addiction merchants. So they had to make sure that they had all the elements of the addiction business model before they got into it. And cheap prices is one of them. You can't be addicted to something you can't afford. You can't buy it often enough to get addicted to it. Sugar is top of the list. And then you have flour, which is so refined that it does create glucose highs and corresponding uh, serotonin highs. You have gluten, which, is, <clears throat> which contains a natural morphine. So we have evidence that gluteomorphine attaches to the opiate receptors in the brain and is mood altering. And then you have dairy. Dairy has four different kinds of casomorphine in it. It's designed to put a 100 pound baby calf to sleep. So it's quite a powerful narcotic. And it doesn't do anything for, for humans, uh, no. So excessive salt has been shown to activate also the opiate pathways. We see morphine addicts 
coming off of morphine and just dumping salt on their food. So you see the transfer there. And then caffeine, of course, uh, elevates dopamine. And, and then there are food additives. So the FDA is really occupied by the food processing industry. So nobody's really monitoring labels and what is actually in products. You think surely the FDA is out there taking food samples and putting them in spectrometers and, you know, finding out. No, that's not going on at all. So once I say to people, once food is in a package, forget it. You have no idea what's in there. And you certainly don't want to stand in this heavily cued grocery store environment and read labels. Oh my goodness. That's like the exact opposite. You want to protect your brain against that food stimulation. So, uh, and then there are just humane issues. Like you don't want to eat animals that have been humanely treated. I think soy is quite suspicious. Um, and then even though corn is not processed, you can eat corn on the cob. No, like your brain has now been so sensitized to high fructose corn syrup and corn is a high sugar vegetable anyway. No, it doesn't work anymore. So we have lists uh, at Food Addiction Resources. And what we say is, okay, here's the excluded list. We know these are problems. Uh, nuts, for example, nuts have uh, naturally occurring tryptophan in them, which is a precursor for serotonin. Uh, high sugar fruits. Like once your brain has been sensitized, high sugar fruits are not going to work anymore. And uh, so we have lists of the excluded foods. That's, you know, that's evidence-based. And then we have lists of unprocessed foods. And that is where people have to go through a process of determining what works for them as individuals. Because of this carbohydrate load, Americans eat a pound per person per day of sugars, flours, high fat dairy, and um, french fries. So, you know, most of that's carbohydrates, refined carbohydrates. Most people have carbohydrate sensitivity across a range. So some people can still, uh, you know, enjoy starchy vegetables. There are a few people out there who can, are okay with non-gluten grains. But um, many people now are much more comfortable if they don't eat anything from that starch column and they're eating vegetables and proteins. And a lot of people now have given up fruit or they're just using the low carb berries. So um, I think, you know, great, you get off the excluded foods, but then there's another process of figuring out what is your own personal carb sensitivity, your carb uh, capacity. And I just find more and more people are better off, better off with, even though I've had that starch column there for 24 years, I'm now telling people, look, if that, if that doesn't work for you, you know, switch over to just vegetables. And then if these fruits don't work for you, switch over to just berries. And if that doesn't work for you, you know, just give up plants altogether and yeah. go ahead. You know, I'm not opposed to carnivore. Eskimos have been carnivores for eons, uh, thousands of years, tens of thousands of years, and they are in fantastic health. Those who have not gotten exposed to processed foods. Humans are incredibly adaptable, incredibly adaptable to all different kinds of diets. The one common factor, and we've seen this demonstrated by Chris Gardner at Stanford, got to take the processed foods out interesting because one of the questions I had for you was when I was you know doing a little bit of research was I know that you like things in moderation so you're not a big fan of fasting because it can kind of trigger that hunger signal and then possibly kind of overeat when you're not fasting and we can talk about that in a second but and I am definitely not uh, all things in moderation because that list of excluded foods your brain is reacting to them like toxic substances so, right. I'm, I'm sorry. I meant more of the, you're right. Um, I don't think yeah. you're in moderation because you do remove a ton of like the sugar removing. Uh, some people would say that's very extreme. So I, I, yeah, I yes, I, yes. I get flack for that. Most of my watchers and listeners are meat based and yeah. they've just done their best by completely removing any yeah. of the sugary, including from vegetables and fruits. Yeah. Um, 
I mean, you have, you have to be a, like thick enough at a certain point that you're like, I don't want anything to that trigger that part of the brain, Yeah. then be stimulated by food and then even think of it as an addictive substance. Yeah. Um, I completely agree with everything you're saying in terms of even against heroin, you know, with all these other addictive behaviors, the easy solution is abstinence, but you can't abstain from food for the rest of your life, right? So um, we have to kind of tempt ourselves every day and try to eat properly with these foods that are highly addictive. Um, And then we have the standard American diet that basically says you should be eating grains, you should be eating a lot of fruit. Yeah, it's horrible things. But I think we are and as you have found, there's the solution where you take out all the not real foods and the processed foods, the foods that trigger that area. And if you've been triggered too much, then yes, like you said, remove the fruits, remove the vegetables that can even trigger that area too. And then find the ground that you can now thrive on healthy or normal foods or Uh real foods. Mm -hmm. Um, And then you can get over then the psychology portion of the addiction, right? That's yeah. So there is, um, you're making an incredibly good point, which is if you want to give up heroin, you can get through your whole day without uh, seeing a needle. You can probably get through a day without seeing the people that you did heroin with. Mm -hmm. Um, But if you're a processed food addict, you cannot get through a day without the what's called associative cueing you're going to be in the place where you uh, suffered the addiction, which is your home. You're going to be driving past the the outlets where you bought the stuff, which is fast food and convenience stores and grocery stores. You're going to be going to your workplace where everybody around you is still eating processed foods and announcing the, the horrible stuff that's in the break room. And you're not going to be able to go in the break room. So the cueing is what is constant. We can get rid of the, the excluded foods. You know, just like an alcoholic gets rid of uh, alcohol. You can do that. It's not, you don't have to eat these horrible processed substances. Absolutely not. You can eat clean food. Just like an alcoholic can take the alcohol out of the drink. But here's what's hard for the alcoholic. Suppose the alcoholic lives in an alcoholic household and that alcoholic is going to come home at five o'clock. Everybody in the house has their glasses out. You have the sound of ice hitting the glass, the sound of things being poured into the glass. You're sitting in the same chairs out on the patio, the same people. They're drinking alcohol and you're trying to drink water. That will not work. Because the cueing is too intense. The reminders, the stimulation. Now that person is likely to, much more likely to go through a whole series of lapses before they um, are able to maintain like a whole year of abstinence. And they're much more likely to get to that year of abstinence sooner if instead of going home and drinking cocktails with their family members, they go to an AA meeting. This is mirror neuron programming. So we have the most powerful brain part of the brain is mirror neurons and mirror neurons do just one thing. They take what is happening in the environment and they direct their, the brain to conform to it because for the 7 million years when human brains were developing, if you were in a tribe, you lived. If you conform to a tribe, you lived. And if you didn't conform, if your mirror neurons were not clever enough, working well enough to get you to a a copy, to mimic, to um, mirror your tribe's behavior, you would die. You would, you would be separated from the tribe. You would be eaten by a predator. You would be, you would die in the hail or from starvation. So you didn't get a chance. The people who had weak mirror neurons that those genes did not get replicated. So the good news is that that is the avenue. You have this little tiny minuscule frontal lobe. People keep thinking that they ought to be able to teach into that frontal lobe. The frontal lobe fires at about 40 transactions per second. 
The rest of the brain fires at 40 million wow. transactions per second. We, the, we are, and, and those are not thinking neurons. The frontal lobe is thinking, but these are not thinking. These are reflexive. They're reacting to stimulation from the environment. So the alcoholic who goes home and uh, sits down and all the cueing is the same. This, this brain, this highly reflexive brain is saying, ah, oh, it's drink time, it's drink time, get some alcohol, it's drink time. This is what we know to do. This is what we're programmed to do. Go, 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 do it. And it'll uh, sooner or later it'll grab onto behavior and that alcoholic will be drinking again. If the alcoholic goes to an AA meeting instead, then it's like, we don't drink under any circumstances. It's the worst thing that could ever happen to us. It nearly killed me and it destroyed all my life. My, it lost my car, my job, my relationships, my family. It's the worst thing on the planet. That brain is going, oh, no alcohol, no alcohol, never, never, never any alcohol. That, that person is going to achieve and maintain abstinence. It is in the environment. The recovery is in the environment. That makes a lot of sense. So it sounds like in order to, um, you know, disrupt our patterns, um, we need to build community and then follow or seek the people that kind of have these habit changes in their lives that yeah. will then we can adapt with these mirror neurons. Um, yeah. So in theory, it sounds, it's more than just sounds, but it's, you know, obviously that sounds like the most, um, I guess, prudent way. But what, if, you know, like, as a busy mom, for example, right? Um, four hours is a lot of time. So if somebody cannot dedicate four hours of their day to get help, do you think that they can still kind of heal from food addiction? Yeah. Yeah. So we get this. Uh, the toughest clients are people who have small children at home and are working. So they just like, no way. Way, no, oh, we got away. So it's our, it's, it's, these are just for members of the ARC. Um, it's our podcast. So every day we record a conference call. It's, and it's confidential. You can, you can only get them if you're in the ARC, in an ARC. But you can play that in the background. So you get home, you need to get dinner on the table, you need to play with your kids, you need to, do whatever, you have a commute, you drive to work, you drive home, and you have the weekends. So if you are playing this gently at a very low volume in the background, this is just like your brain is, oh, that's our tribe, we hear our tribe, we're in our tribe. What does that tribe do again? Oh, they don't eat processed foods. Okay, well, that's our tribe, that's what we're doing, so we're not eating processed foods. You're still able, just from that murmur, in the background of voices that don't eat processed foods, your brain is going to be able to conform to that. Now there is another piece to this, which is if you keep showing your brain mainstream culture, your brain is still gonna be looking over there and oh no, 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 that's our tribe. We do what they do. So if you have the television on, and you have underweight actors who are uh, eating disordered, your brain is gonna be looking at that and saying, oh, th there must be a famine on somewhere. Look, look how thin those people are. There must be a famine somewhere. We should eat more. Or, uh, or it could work the other way, which is look how gorgeous those glamorous, those figures are. Um, I think we'll stop eating so that uh, we can be glamorous too. And then you stop eating and you build up this panic in the most primitive part of the brain about famine. And so television is, is just about uh, all mainstream culture. Cause I read uh, some particular like mainstream media streams and they are just constantly deluding, uh, diverting attention, just uh, awful. So while you're stimulating your brain with this new tribe, oh, I really want to eat like them. They eat clean. They're healthy. They're happy. They're productive. They're fun. They're so smart. 
you've got that murmuring back on here. If you turn on the television, that just wipes it out. The people on television are typically doing stupid things. You know, it's, it's the comedy yeah. show. No, it, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, even when a lot of the, our, you know, the people that are watching this, they go to the doctor and they've been eating like a high protein and fat diet, their LDL or their cholesterol will be sort of out of range, even though their glucose and A1C are in the normal range and their inflammatory markers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then yeah. they're told that they need to change their diet, right? Yeah. And so as much as we're like, no, I know what I'm doing is right. You can't help understanding knowing that they're kind of the the subject matter expert right they are the doctor and they're the authority and so uh, i think there's a little part of us that then kind of questions yeah our sure. diet and then over time it, more and more when people are like that's all you're eating you're not eating any vegetables or you can't even eat fruit that's it's too extreme it's like little by little and i think then the situation that causes your emotions to go really high it just i feel like that's what causes so many people to then end up relapsing yeah, yeah. We know that the stress pathway in the brain and the craving pathway is just very tightly intertwined. Um, you mentioned fuse, uh, thought fusion the, uh, earlier. Yes, so if you could actually talk about, um, I know you talk a lot about how food addiction, um, a lot of people use food as an escape or a way to just kind of deal with life. So if you can talk a little bit about that, um, some of the kind of ways that people use food as, um, you know, an escape. And then yeah, that I think goes with the stress. Yeah. And I'm going to, I'm going to just reframe this. This is not deliberate. People are not doing this deliberately. Um, I do like the word using, like you use drugs, you use processed foods. You're not eating it. You're ingesting it. You know, like everybody knows that if you have a, marijuana candy, uh, you're not eating, you're doing drugs. <laughs> but these processed foods are, are so well disguised, people think they're eating them. They're not, they're using them. So do people use processed foods to handle their emotions? I, I don't think of it that way. So here's the way I think of it. Is uh, something stressful happens, and the stress pathway in the brain is activated. So it's like an alert system. Like if you're a primitive person and you're walking down a trail and a saber tooth tiger comes out, you need immediate strong stress reactions, red hot alert, run. And the, so this again, just think of this environmental signaling. Oh, I'm being signaled that there's a tiger right there. And what happens is the stress pathway just explodes you get this huge rush of adrenaline the brain actually kind of shuts down and all the blood flow goes to the arms and legs so that you can run and get away that's a stress reaction none of that was thoughtful none of that involved thinking all of it involved a reflex from a clump of neurons so when we experience stress and we get that adrenaline rush, the frontal lobe shuts down. So you're not making a decision to use food to soothe. It's not a decision at all. It's a reflex in the brain because everywhere around you, you see people using food to, uh, in association with emotions. But here's the other piece. I think I wish everybody on the planet knew this. And Judy, I'm so glad that you're asking about it. Stress and, and craving neurons are just all intertwined with each other. So you're, you're not choosing. We just established that you're not choosing. This is a reflex, a neuron reflex. When you get that stress, it just reaches right over and reverberates all those craving neurons. And the craving neurons and the stress neurons get a hold of behavior. By now, your frontal lobe is completely shut down. All the blood supply is going to these reflexive neurons and not to your thinking neurons. And so you just, you're reflexively, not thoughtfully, um, eating processed foods. You get upset, you eat processed foods. It's not, it's an addiction. It's not 
rational thought. That's why addictions are in the diagnostic manual for mental illnesses, because it's so irrational. Rational takes place in the frontal lobe. All this behavior is being driven by these ancient, reflective, reflexive neurons. I know it's radically different from the way anybody else is thinking about this, but you know, there are 2,000 citations in the, in the textbook. And what I didn't, this didn't even get as far as mirror neurons. I don't talk about mirror neurons in here. Um, I need to write a paper on it, but yeah. And this has all been highly aggravated by the processed food industry using the addiction business model. They know how to hi hyperactivate these um, stress and craving neurons through repeat advertising, through highly addictive products, through young age, through availability and cheap prices. It's a business model. And it just they've just worked it on us tragically well. It's interesting because if you think about how, you know, our, our modern society, the standard American diet, the standard registered dietitians or nutritionists say, eat in moderation, eat so many times a day. And so you're eating very little. But one of the things that you say causes kind of like the food addiction is when you feel deprived or you're hungry. And if you're eating these kind of empty calories and then not eating enough because you're like, I need to eat a salad with very low fat and, you know, all these things that aren't really yeah. satiating, no. then it causes that area probably to be hungry. And mm -hmm. then you turn to food, which is not even satiating the right, you know, mechanisms yeah. for you to feel full. Yeah. Um, one thing that I do notice, though, because another um, component you talk about is deprivation, like feeling deprived and then you kind of turn to food. Um, one thing I notice is when people are trying to fight their food addictions is they do feel deprived. Like I, I, they feel like a sense of loss, right? So, you know, yeah. during birthdays or during holidays, everyone gets to eat that, but me, right? We are a natural um, community oriented species. And then mm -hmm. to, um, you know, during the holidays, you can't pick and choose your family, but your family is probably eating those kinds of foods. So then yeah. how do you not, feel like, woe is me, I'm deprived, and I don't get to partake in what the rest of the community is doing, albeit it's not healthy. So yeah. how do you deal with that? So that is this tribe. That's the arc. That's the four hours a day reprogramming those neurons. So what you're describing in, in a normal uh, life is it's a programmed response you see somebody eating processed foods and the neuro pathway, thank you very much, food industry, the neuro pathway from seeing them eat that food goes straight over to, I'm not conforming with that tribe. And this is kind of scary. I'm upset. Oh, I'm feeling deprived. Well, heck yeah. So that's a, that's a pathway. That's the pathway that gets created when you see a McDonald's ad and there's a family situ situated there. Or you see a Coke ad and it's all these young people. They're so happy and they're in a group and they're drinking Coca-Cola. So if you, if you try to stop doing those things without putting yourself in a new tribe, the, sur the survival mechanism will just be panicked. No, you're not conforming. You're going to die. You know, you're, you're going to be eaten by a predator. It's just, it's really deep-seated and very ancient fears that if you're not conforming to a tribe, if you're not in a tribe, uh, you're going to die. Because for 7 million years, that was true. So it's the murmuring in the background. It's, it's and on those moments when you can get into a video chat, an ARC video chat, or... Um, you know, there are some physical meetings that really understand this. You, uh, you're reassuring your mirror neurons that you're in a tribe and you're okay. Now, so right now the food industry has been able to program, oh, I see somebody drinking a soda. Oh, and, and then the, the program, the, pa the program pathways, they're having a good time. I want to have a good time too. So here's the reprogramming. You see somebody drinking a soda and you think, oh my God, they're going to get cancer. I wish they would stop that. 
That is reprogramming. It's just like when you're learning a language. You see a car. You grew up speaking English. Your brain thinks car. But when you want to learn French, that's the only language I know, aside from English. But when you see a car and you're in France and you want to say, um, I'd like to rent that car, you want that car image to trigger a new pathway. And that pathway goes over to the word voiture instead of car. This is reprogramming. You want to be able to look at people eating processed foods and think, oh my God, they're killing themselves. The same way you would look at somebody smoking a cigarette. You would say, how could they be that stupid? Don't they know? No, they don't. They're addicted. So that is reprogramming. You don't feel deprived. Oh my goodness. You just feel like this incredible sense of gratitude. How did I get picked to get out of this horrible mess? That takes reprogramming on a lot of it. And then a lot of reinforcement, really, for the rest of your life. It's, um, you know, if you learn, like, like I studied Italian. I, I always wanted to learn Italian. But I didn't keep it up. I studied it for two years. I went to a class uh, a couple of times a week. And then I took, a tri I took my kids to Italy. And, um, and then I dropped it. Well, I can't speak Italian now. I mean, I could probably revive it. But that's, those are, you know, my Italian neurons are weak and flabby. and they're not, they're not able to put out a signal and bring up the word for a car, which is, I think, me uh, mechanized or something. I don't so, know what it's like. <laughs> yeah, but like I had a Belgian stepmom for years and years. So I did keep my French up, and I lived in France. Uh, sorry, I lived in Belgium. My dad got transferred to Belgium. So my foundation was a lot stronger, speaking French every day. I tried to learn German, but I had a Swiss roommate. I didn't learn much German, but that Swiss roommate didn't speak English. I had to speak French with her all day long. So I got a lot more extensive training in French. And if I had to speak French today, I could manage a conversation, even though I don't use it very much. So you just, you've got to get kind of the sense. What does this mean to program a neuron? Well, that is the, uh, that's the prime example. You go to a party, the mainstream programming says, oh, party, they're eating these processed foods and drinking alcohol and maybe doing drugs. I am so lonely. I miss that so much. I feel so deprived. That's the old programming. The new programming is you go to that event and you think, wow, these people are destroying their lives and their hells, and it's just so hard to see them in doing that. I think I'll just say hello to everybody and leave. That's the new programming. But that's how you deal with that, quote, unquote. You know, nobody says, oh, I can't smoke. I'm so deprived. It's because they know that cigarettes are killing you. Right. But it's just the, the general knowledge, and this is why I'm so grateful to you, is the general knowledge about the unbelievable – toxicity of these processed foods in the heart heart disease cigarettes are like heart disease lung cancer emphysema processed foods are like 125 really serious diseases 1800 people per day like 600 and let's see 678,000 people a year in the u.s alone are dying from these substances we have this nice euphemistic term, diet-related diseases. <laughs> They're dying from an addiction. And it's so well hidden. Like the tobacco company learned that from the tobacco experience. Like, don't let anybody know that this is going on. They spend 10 billions of dollars a year with media. It's unbelievably well hidden. You know, one question I had is, so just like how with your, you know, if we were to talk about the language thing, so with French, you know, over time, even though you weren't necessarily with community as much now, right? So with your French background or your the community, but you can now keep it up because I guess some of the neural pathways have become that heavily ingrained in you, whereas your, um, the Italian did not. And so it's not there, right? So just like you were saying how neural pathways are, or neurons are kind of like muscles, so if we're changing into this new reprogramming, 
are you saying that it takes about five years of this reprogramming to kind of have it as strength as strong as your French language would you think this is such a good question and um, it's something that I really have it heavy on my heart that I need to make some new videos for people coming into the arc like what can you really expect mm -hmm. um, it all depends on how much exposure that makes sense. So if I went to Italian class for four hours a day, if I am not Italian, we'd come back like that. But if I went once a week, it would take a lot longer. So the other thing is, is that my, um, my French, now that I have to flip this analogy, so just <laughs> see if I can do this. My French, I had many, many more hours of French exposure Okay, so it's more deeply ingrained. Sure. It's more deeply seated. It's more deeply rooted in my brain. And I can pull that uh, back up more easily as a result. If in childhood uh, you got all the sugar you wanted and you got it morning, noon, and night, and your parents were sugar addicts and there was sugar all over the house and you could always go in the kitchen, nobody monitored it, you could have as much sugar as you wanted, if you wanted to go to the candy store, your, your parents would give you the money to go to the candy store. That's a very deeply ingrained, very deeply rooted, very deep addiction. That is going to be able to be revived easily. Got so it. it's not going to take a lot of provocation uh, in order to, for that addiction to reach up and control behavior again. Now, especially if you have drug addiction following it, if you have drug and alcohol addiction following that. So, you know, the cool kids, you're not cool in high school because you've eaten all this sugar, you know, you've had brain fog and you have a body shape that is not going to get you elected, you know, homecoming queen. Uh, you might turn to the drug crowd for acceptance. And so on top of this first 15 years of sugar addiction, now you have 10 years or 15 years of drug and alcohol addiction. It's another very, very deep seated, very deep rooted, very deeply embedded uh, neuro programming. For somebody with that kind of background, five years is not going to be enough. And even if they come to all four hours, well, honestly, if they come to all four hours, I don't know. Because what's really hard is to persuade that person that they need all four hours. And so it's just kind of like fighting back like a wild animal in there. So I went to therapy for eating disorders and in the, that whole food addiction, so many people had in tandem um, either drug or alcohol addiction. Mm -hmm. And so when they were trying to give up both, it was nearly impossible. Um, and so they first worked on the alcohol and like drug addiction, and then they would work on the food addiction. Um, uh -huh. But then they would end up relapsing with both. It was so bizarre or not so bizarre. Based upon it didn't have enough murmuring in the background. Oh this yeah. They, they, um, the therapy wants you to eat all foods in moderation. And so you would have to do challenge foods with like eating a cupcake in front of your dietitian, saying that that is realistic moderation. And if you oh, can eat gosh. this, then they would give you a cup of Ensure, to, which is just processed sugar. And uh, hey, at least you're getting nutrients with all the added sugar. Yeah. <laughs> but you can pick and not eat meat, and they were okay with that. So you were okay to be vegetarian, though, but you could not selectively pick out sugar. Isn't that wild? Okay, that just makes me, just makes me so sad. But that's how conventional eating disorder facilities are run. That because they go by the standard American diet, right? It's grains, and yet you can pick and choose not to eat the meat. You could say I'm vegetarian, and they'll honor that. But if you're like, I don't really eat sugar, they're like, No, 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 that's an eating disorder behavior. Yeah, you got there's there's a really interesting story behind the um, the food pyramid. I hope that this video has given you some more insight into your relationship with food. Next week, I will be releasing the next portion of this video. All right, guys, you know the drill. Eat a lot of meat. Take care of your bodies because it is the only place you have to live. I will talk to you guys next week. Take care. Bye.